Hi everyone and welcome to this knowledge clip on international migration, more specifically theories of international migration. So today I'm going to explain uh, in a very basic way the laws of Ernest Ravenstein, who can be considered one of the classical theorists of international migration. So Ravenstein, he was a cartographer at the British War Office at the end of the 19th century and he established a series of migration laws, which he published uh, in a journal at the end of the 19th century, based on an analysis of census data. So census data are full population data that governments do gather around their population every uh, couple of years, that can be every five years, can be every 10 years. And he used that data to investigate how people moved, migrate, within the United Kingdom at the end of the 19th uh, century. And the laws that he formulated have been applied to international migration as well afterwards. And some of them, as you uh, will see, are still relevant uh, today. And we will discuss this also probably um, if you follow one of my lectures uh, on campus or uh, hybrid lectures as well, following up on this knowledge clip. So let's dive into the different, uh, the different laws that he formulated, but let's start first to be very clear about the scope of the laws that he formulated, right? So Ernest Ravenstein uh, indicated that the primary motivation for migration generally is always the economy. So people move to another location because of higher wages, because of better work. So there is some certain economic determinism in the laws that he formulated. And so it can be used to explain why people move or why economic migration exists, but it is less apt to apply, for example, to uh, refugees or forced migration. So that is something important to keep in mind. Okay, so let's uh, start with the first law of Ravenstein. So most migrants migrate short distances to absorption centers, which means that generally people do not tend to move very long away from their home. So generally what we see, if you come, let's say, from Tilburg, for example, the likelihood of moving to uh, internationally or nationally to Amsterdam, uh, to Antwerp in Belgium, for example, will be much higher compared to moving to New York, uh, Osaka, or uh, somewhere in South Africa, for example. So generally, migrants tend to move short distances to absorption centers, which are places where more people, migrants generally, are already uh, residing. The second law that he formulated is that people also tend uh, to move from rural areas to urban areas. But this has an effect, of course, because the more people move from uh, agricultural regions towards city areas, the less people live in these rural areas. So you have rural depopulation and these gaps, he indicated, are generally also filled up by new migrants who also then move from further areas away towards these uh, rural areas. The third law of Ernest Ravenstein is that absorption or in-migration uh, is at the expense of dispersion or out-migration. This simply means that if you have many people that migrate uh, towards a certain location, you generally will see that less people move away from that location. And if you want to know a little bit more about uh, fine-grained dynamics, how this works, I also recommend to watch the knowledge clip um, on migration transition theories, where we specifically link um, in-migration and out-migration to uh, levels of development uh, of countries. So if you want to know more about this law, I recommend to watch that knowledge clip as well. But important is to remember in migration, so in migration, people moving into a certain location, into a certain country, generally means that there is less people uh, that are going uh, out of that country. And that is related, but that's for another knowledge clip, uh, to uh, developmental processes. The fourth law of Ravenstein was that each migration stream has a counter stream. This is also quite logical. It simply means that if you have people moving from, let's say, Poland to the United Kingdom, then you also have people moving from the United Kingdom to Poland. That can be British citizens that move towards Poland, but that can also be, of course, return migration of Polish migrants 
who after a while decide to return to their country of origin. Then the fifth law of uh, Ravenstein is that long distance migrants, so those who move long distances, not the short distances, which are predominantly um, what migrants do, they tend to move to great centers of commerce and industry. So when people decide to move for a very long distance, generally they will not end up in a rural area or a small town somewhere, but they tend to go to the big cities, the big urban areas, where there is a lot of commerce, a lot of industry, particularly job opportunities and higher wages, which also are at the core of the laws of Ravenstein. The sixth, and uh, that is almost the last uh, law already of Ravenstein, is that those in rural areas migrate more compared to those in urban areas. That is something that uh, we still see uh, today. People who live in agricultural regions are much more likely to move to uh, urban areas and uh, are much more likely to move compared to those who already reside in an urban, uh, urban area. And then finally, uh, he also indicated that women migrate more. So we already had uh, some interest in the gender dimension of migration and he indicated that particularly short distances. So women are much more likely to move uh, short distances away um, compared to men and they're also more likely to move compared to men. So this is uh, in a nutshell what Ravenstein was talking about at the end of the 19th century. Push-pull model theories, for example, are also based on his insights, but that is for another knowledge clip. Thank you for watching and um, I hope you enjoyed this video.